just to survey real quickly, I'll tell you what you already know, but good to get it all in one list. We have the rise of an Islamist regime in Egypt with, I'm sure you'll hear, just huge instability there today. The lawlessness of the Sinai, the carnage and deterioration of the Assad regime in Syria, the triumph of Hezbollah in Lebanon, and uncertainty in Jordan. And this all means that Israel, the United States, and others can no longer rely on relative stability and predictability among the key actors in the region. So to explore the current status of the region and its unclear future, uh, we put together, as I just mentioned, uh, truly an outstanding panel, a dream panel in my opinion. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about each and then we'll get going. Uh, Amos Harel, who's uh, farthest down over here, is one of Israel's leading media experts on military and defense issues. He's also co-authored a pair of critically acclaimed bestsellers uh, on Israel's war with Hezbollah in 2006 and its response to Palestinian terrorism. Next to Amos is uh, the executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, Robert Satloff, and he's one of America's most prolific and well-respected commentators on Arab and Islamic politics, as well as U.S. Middle East policy. And then closest to me, uh, Brett Stevens, who is a former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, uh, is currently the foreign affairs columnist and deputy editorial page director of the Wall Street Journal, and writes frequently and vigorously, it says here, and it's true if you've read his writings, uh, on issues concerning Israel and the Middle East. So following their presentations, uh, they will take questions from the floor. And I think we'll lead off by former agreement uh, with Rob Satla. Good morning. I'll try that again. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, it's wonderful to be back at this APAC uh, annual convention. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be at the policy conference and to, to appear with my panelists. We were just joking before that uh, in the age of Marco Rubio, they gave a dozen water bottles for us up here on the panel. <laughs> Evidently, Poland Springs has the, uh, the concession. Um, we're here to talk about what I would call the new, new Middle East. This is not the new Middle East that we dreamt of 20 years ago. Um, and it, is, it is, does give a bit of pause to think that it is almost 20 years that uh, countries and leaders, um, many people just like, uh, like you and, and like, like me, were excited at the prospect of a new Middle East in which borders had disappeared, in which trade between Arabs and Israelis and Turks um, would transform the region in which peace Peace was the dominant theme uh, in which there was universal support, universal support for the inclusion of all states, um, no belligerency, uh, lions lying down with lambs. I think you know the rest of the story. Well, we're in a new, new Middle East. A Middle East defined by very different very different principles, very different actors, very different imperatives. I'm going to offer you five, five lenses, five trends to look at this new, new Middle East. I'll say at the outset that you're never going to hear me use the term Arab Spring. I think at one of, um, perhaps it was last year's policy conference, I went off on a 10-minute disposition on why that's a silly concept. I'm not going to do that again. Um, uh, maybe there's some people here that remember that. Um, um, I will say that I think a far more appropriate term for what we have seen and what is going on everywhere from Yemen to Syria is a term with which people in this room are quite familiar because it's a term that was born in the Israeli-Palestinian context. It's a term that means throwing off, a term that means change, perhaps violent, perhaps not, the outcome of which is still uncertain. And that word is intifada. 
And I think what we have seen in the Middle East and what we are seeing throughout the region still is a series of intifadat, the multiple of intifadans. And we will eventually see what transpires, but it is still very early in this process. So far, though, I think we can make five observations. And if you're sitting in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or Beersheba, these are not happy observations. First, the region is increasingly divided between two mega trends, Shi radicalism and Sunni radicalism. In many places, these trends compete. They compete in Iraq, they compete inside Syria, they compete in various places. Regrettably, one place where they have found ways to cooperate through a division of labor is on the border of Israel. Look at the recent Gaza conflict. In the Gaza conflict, we had political support for Hamas coming from Sunni extremist leaders and Sunni radical states, Egypt, Qatar. And we had mil military support from Hamas coming from Shi radicalism, coming from Iran. It is a sad situation when the one place where Sunni extremists and Shi extremists can find common cause is the battle against Israel. We should recognize that. Point two, Israel looks out at the neighborhood around it and I think for the first time in a generation, for the first time since 1973, it can see that its two most powerful neighbors, Egypt and Syria, no longer, in the case of Egypt, and almost certainly not soon in the case of Syria, will be governed by leaders who have an interest not to go to war. Let me say that again. For the last 40 years, since the end of the October War, the leaders of Egypt and Syria have been governed, the countries of Egypt and Syria have been governed by leaders who have recognized that it was not in their interest to go to war with Israel. They weren't Zionists, but they recognized that their national interests lied elsewhere. And that gave rise to what has been 40 years of no state-to-state -state conflict between Israel and its neighbors. We should recognize what happened the last 40 years. Yes, there was Lebanon. Yes, there is Hezbollah and Hamas. But good old-fashioned war, tanks coming over the borders, planes flying over cities, we haven't seen it. That, I am afraid, may now be at an end. With Islamists in charge in Egypt and Islamists almost certainly in charge in Syria, the ideology of conflict of, with Israel has returned to state power. This doesn't mean that there's going to be war tomorrow. In fact, it won't happen tomorrow. And it won't happen the day after tomorrow. But the presumption that the leaders are committed not to go to war, I think, no longer is the reality. This is a huge change. Forty years, I think, has come to an end. Third, this is not connected to the Arab Spring, or the Arab Intifadas, as it were, but it is something that hovers off, hovers off in the periphery. It's the subject of a dozen other panels, but it plays its role, and that is, of course, the Iranian nuclear challenge. So everything that we're talking about in terms of Israel's relations with Arabs has to be viewed in this context. We can't disassociate this story from that story. It's all happening at the same time. Fourth, confrontation with Iran, this change between Arab states and Israel, is all occurring at a moment when intifada, 
either internal or between Palestinians and Israelis, may come to the West Bank. Hamas, Hamas did not win the battle against Israel a couple of months ago. But Hamas is today having its sights set on Ramallah. And the weakness of the Palestinian leadership is an invitation for Hamas to expand its influence and perhaps its power through the West Bank. This too is part of the intifadas that we are seeing played out in Egypt and Yemen and Libya and Syria. Yes, it hasn't come to Ramallah and Nablus and Hebron yet, but it may. And if it does, if it does through the weakness of the Palestinian leadership, through the fecklessness of Arab states who've promised much and delivered no, um, virtually nothing, then another good news situation that few people recognize, the good news of the fact that there's been so little terrorism from the West Bank over the last four years, a piece of good news that we really should stand up and cheer because we should remember where we were just 11, 12 years ago. A thousand Israelis killed. That good news may be over as well. And then last, the last of these sort of five observations about the change in the Middle East over the last two and a half years has to do with American leadership and uncertainty about its direction. All of this occurs at a moment when both allies and adversaries don't really know where America is going. The reverberations of this uncertainty in Egypt, in Syria, in the Gulf vis-a-vis -vis Iran, I think is something that feeds the worst impulses of the most negative elements in the region. Much of this is inadvertent. We Americans think that we are right to prioritize our domestic affairs. But leadership is something that needs to think bigger and see that over the horizon, the crisis may be exponentially bigger than what the day-to-day -day concerns are all about. And that leadership, and please, I should say, this is not meant to be a partisan issue because there's leadership vacuums all over Washington. That leadership, as far as our allies and adversaries are concerned, just isn't there. This, I'm afraid, is the Middle East that we face in 2013. It's the Middle East that Israel faces in 2013. It's the Middle East that hopefully you, speaking to your representatives, you up on Capitol Hill, you can help change people's views about. Thank you very much. First of all, it's a great uh, honor and privilege to be back here uh, today and to see so many uh, uh, friendly faces. Um, and it's, it's a real honor to be on, on this panel. It's a little daunting to go after or to be sandwiched between Rob and uh, Amos uh, for a variety of reasons, not, n not only their, their expertise, but my shtick is usually to be the most depressing guy in the room. Um, <laughs> And I feel like you've stolen my thunder. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my best to, to make it seem even worse than the... Uh, I want to talk... I want to offer a f framework for what I'm about to say that's a little bit theoretical, but if you'll follow me for a couple of minutes, maybe it will make what's happening uh, throughout the Middle East today seem a little more um, uh, intelligible. And what I want to talk about is the nature of uh, unpredictability. Now, if I ask you, what, 
what are you going to have for breakfast tomorrow morning? You probably don't know um, and probably have no way of knowing. And you may not even be sure that you're going to have breakfast tomorrow, uh, depending on your, on your schedule and your mood. But knock on wood, you're probably going to be around to have breakfast tomorrow. There's at least that degree of predictability when it comes to the question of what, what, what you'll be eating tomorrow morning. If I, if I ask you who is the next, who will be the next president of the United States, I mean, obviously it will be Hillary Clinton, but assuming <laughs> there's, some, there's some question mark there, um, well, we can say we don't know who the next president is going to be, but with what logicians would call a moral certainty, we know that there will be a next president, right? Most of our life, we, we live in a, with a certain kind of unpredictability, but it's unpredictability that happens within certain structures, certain systems. That is to say, the broader systems that govern our political life, our economic life, our personal lives, and so on. And so this is something I call subsystemic unpredictability. It happens beneath the level of systems. Now, if you think of the course of human history, there are certain kinds of unpredictability which, in effect, attack the systems themselves, bring into question the validity of those systems. And if you look around the world, take an example a little far afield from the Middle East, although uh, less and less so, take the question of Greece. I mean, most people don't wake up in the morning and wonder what currency they're going to be using to purchase their morning bread. But the Greeks are beginning to ask that question in a uh, serious way. If you go to Syria to get closer to the Middle East, the question isn't really who is going to succeed Bashar Assad if and when uh, he, he, I expect, when he, he eventually falls. The real question is, is there going to be Syria? Something much more basic about the future of Syria is at stake than simply the question of who is going to um, lead, that, lead that country. So this is what I call suprasystemic unpredictability. It's about the nature of the systems in which, in which we ourselves operate. And if you think about the course of human history, there have been periods which have been dominated by certain kinds of systems. You might call them the Westphalian system after 1648 or the Concert of Europe after 1815, but they're systems that define a certain period of time and attached to them are a variety of institutions. And we live in a system that's existed more or less since 1945. And the single greatest fact of the system in which we have all been raised, except if you're very, very old, um, is the system of America being a world-leading power with overwhelming military might that is capable and willing to exert its military power in defense of certain kinds of interests. That's the world we know. That's sort of what we think about. Now, as I look at the Middle East, this the, the factor that strikes me uh, most profoundly is that that system, that assumption, no longer holds quite the way it used to. And when there are questions about the, um, the strength and the enduring stability of a system, things happen that are, in effect, beyond the ordinary, extraordinary. Let's look at what has happened in the Middle East. Well, for the last 65 years at least, the Middle East has been defined by a number of factors. One, as I said just now, it's the reality of American power. It's been a reality that Israel has known for its entire history. Since the day Israel has founded, was founded, Israel has always existed in the shadow and with the knowledge of American power and American capacity to act in the region. What's true of Israel has also been true of countries like Jordan. It's been true of countries like Saudi Arabia. It's been true of, of the Gulf states. That assumption is not as valid today as it was just a few years ago. There's a real question about whether America will have the capacity to intervene in the Middle East the way it has before, and failing the capacity, obviously, whether it will have um, even the will to do so. The second thing that's happening is the centrality of, um, of the Middle East with respect to its oil uh, wealth. 
One of the interesting facts, the International uh, Energy Agency, not to be confused with the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, recently reported that by 2020, the United States will be the world's largest supplier, producer of energy. I think I'm not, it's the United States and then, and then it's even larger if you include Mexico and, and North America. Now, this is a very important fact. It's important for us, and in many ways, it's a very welcome fact for, for all of us that we, we don't have to depend on these scoundrels for our, um, for our uh, tank of gas. But it's also going to change um, relations in the Middle East. These are societies, certainly the Gulf states, the oil-producing states, are societies that will no longer be able to wield uh, the oil lever domestically or internationally the way they had. Now, as I said, in many ways that's a great thing. In some ways it's not such a great thing. Because whatever we have right now in Saudi Arabia is probably better than whatever will happen after this regime is succeeded in Saudi Arabia. The same goes for Kuwait, um, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates and so on. So that is also fundamentally changing. The third point is that the system of state structures is under profound assault. I mean, you look at a map, you're a kid, you grow up and you're like, what's the capital of Algeria? Oh, Algiers, and you know, it's, anyway, you sort of look at a map and you see these countries, right? And they have borders and they have notions of, of sovereignty. I mean, it's a part of the, it's an extension of the Westphalian system that Europe adopted in the 17th uh, century. And you know, a lot of the states that we had in the Middle East were squalid, nasty, aggressive, uh, horrible states. Um, but they were states, and they had some kind of limiting uh, uh, authority and sovereignty. Now that is being systematically eroded, uh, and has been uh, systematically eroded over the past few years. As I said, we don't know if there's going to be a Syria in five years. We can't entirely be sure if there's going to be an Iraq in five years. There is no such thing as Palestine. There never was any such thing as Palestine, really. But now it's another great question. What is Palestine? Well, there's Gaza under Hamas. There's the West Bank under, presumably under uh, Fatah for, for, as long as that, uh, uh, for as long as that lasts. Lebanon is a shambolic state. Even Egypt, which is you know, by, most, by common consensus considered really the one true state in the Middle East, the future of Egypt is seriously uh, in question. Libya, same story. So what happens as these systems start to dissolve? What takes its place? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And the final thing that is on the verge of changing, I know we're, this is not the Iran panel, much as I'd like to talk about it all day, um, which is that Israel may be on the cusp of losing um, its status as the sole Middle Eastern, I'm excluding Pakistan obviously, as the sole Mid Middle Eastern nuclear state. Uh, and uh, it's not just a matter of Iran acquiring uh, weapons or at least a weapons capability imminently, which is effectively amounts to uh, the same thing. But the Saudis are building something like 16 nuclear reactors, which is apparently the ideal number of reactors you want to build if you want a dual use capability. Uh, the UAE is in what's so-called a one-two-three agreement with the United States. We are experiencing, a, 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 we're in a moment, at the opening moment of uh, nuclear proliferation throughout, uh, throughout the Middle East, if, if nothing is done literally within the space of the next, um, uh, of the next few months. So these are, the, th this is, these are some of the realities that we've known, and those realities are beginning to uh, crumble. And we need to think very carefully about what this means. There is a school of thought out there which says, looking, say, at Syria, you know, may it last forever. We have 70,000 people killed. This is, a, this is a society that is going to be uh, literally at one another's uh, throats for, for a very long time. Surely that will be in the interest of Israel and perhaps also in the, in the interest of the United States that you have some kind of pan- uh, uh, pan-Middle Eastern uh, civil war focused on Syria. I'm not sure that that's a particularly good argument. First of all, 70,000 people dead, uh, a regime uh, lobbing Scud missiles at its own city, that's, that's a bad, bad thing. Um, but it's also not clear whether what emerges from that chaos won't in fact be worse than, uh, uh, than, than, than what we've already known. Another question is, well, what, what takes the place of some of these regimes? Well, it's very, very hard to say. Um, 
But one of the one people have talked a great deal about the rise of Islamism, the rise of Islamism in the uh, in in Egypt and Hezbollah in, in Lebanon and so on. There are now real questions about what kind of Islamism uh, are we going to have, and is it going to be merely scary, fanatical, regressive, pro-semi-totalitarian Islamism, which is what is emerging, in fact, in places like uh, Egypt and even Tunisia, or is it going to be substantially, uh, uh, substantially worse than that, which is another real possibility. I mean, people always think, well, there's a, there's a kind of a moderate element in the, in the Muslim Brotherhood. And, you know, my standard joke is, well, there was a moderate element in the Nazi movement, you know, typified by Albert Speer, uh, but he was still a Nazi. And uh, um, so, so we're going to see not just, uh, we're going to see a, a kind of uh, a variety of Islamisms emerging and contending throughout the Middle East, also among the Palestinians. Uh, and that's something that should, uh, that should concern us a great deal. I guess the final point I want to make is, is very similar to what Rob made, and maybe this will be thematic for, for, this, uh, uh, for this conference. But we should be really concerned about what the retreat of American power means, not just for Israel, but what it means for the United States as well. It's a very beguiling and, in fact, in some ways very American thought to say that we can just kind of throw off these miserable entanglements that we've had in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan, all these double-dealing uh, uh, scoundrels, and, and, and we'll be happier people and we'll be able to deal with pleasant subjects like the sequester and um, the uh, TSA budgeting. Um, but we live in a sing uh, we live in uh, we live in a single world, uh, and uh, the Middle East still matters to us, even if we frack our way towards a um, uh, more energy independent uh, 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 future. Uh, we should think very carefully about what it means to leave a whole region of the world in effective chaos, because we've done that once before. We started doing it in 1919. And we went on our merry way for about 20 years, and then we reaped the whirlwind. The United States cannot afford to leave the world um, alone. Israel certainly can hardly afford to be uh, left alone. And we should think very carefully, very carefully, um, as a country, those of us in this room who have influence in Congress and, and, and other quarters, think very carefully about an America that thinks it can afford not to think about the Middle East. Thank you. Well, since both of my uh, colleagues went for the doom and gloom approach, I don't think I have any other choice. I so will just do the bad cop, bad cop, worse cop uh, routine. <laughs> <laughs> the basic approach in Israel towards uh, what uh, Dr. Satloff has already uh, called, uh, has already said it was not actually the Arab Spring. We prefer uh, uh, either the Arab turmoil or the Arab uh, upheaval is one of suspicion. We've been for many years in this region. It's a very tough neighborhood and these years have uh, taught us to, to be skeptics. If I look at the recent experiences of the Israeli voter during the last two decades, then he's seen he or she have seen three um, withdrawals, the Oslo Accords, the withdrawal from southern Lebanon, and then uh, disengagement from the Gaza Strip. And in all three cases, uh, Israel received international praise, but the enemy used the areas uh, that we evacuated as sort of a base of operations for further uh, rocket attack and suicide bombing attacks against Israel. And then, of course, there's a Syrian precedent uh, just three years ago, there was an almost unanimous uh, support among Israeli defense chiefs in negotiating a peace process, a, a peace agreement with Syria, which would include a full Israeli withdrawal from the Golan Heights. And Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, has a, has a point when he says right now, it was a good thing that we didn't go for that. Now, uh, the Israeli prime minister went through uh, quite a tough political campaign in the elections uh, in late January. He's still uh, fighting over um, establishing the coalition, and uh, the direction of the next government is not clear yet. But it did turn out that the Israeli voter, because we've had relative uh, years of uh, calm by our standards, of course, did concentrate uh, this time on economic issues, 
and on um, the issues of the face of the Israeli society, and this probably explains the, the great success of uh, Yair Lapid. Uh, but still, the, a major question in the eyes of many Israeli voters is always the sense of personal security. And uh, Netanyahu, those who did vote for Netanyahu, I think he did finally win the election because of that, because um, in the eyes of many Israelis, he's seen as responsible, as cautious, and as somebody who, as I said, is um, skeptic or suspicious towards uh, Arab partners and would not be disillusioned regarding uh, more uh, withdrawals. So the basic approach uh, remains, it's a tough world out there, the partners are temporary, not only the regime might change, the actual entity might change. Look at Syria. It's no, I just saw a piece in The Economist, and the headline was the country, the country formerly known as Syria. That's quite correct. It's not a country anymore. Um, if we look at Egypt, we've earned 34 years of peace, but it's rather clear that we will not see the, enjoy the same kind of quiet in the next years. <coughs> And the conclusion that mo most Israelis make is that uh, one should proceed, if at all, towards the neighbors very, very cautio cautiously. We should um, remain uh, with a level of deterrence. We should keep spending money on our military. Uh, and we should try and, and use um, Western uh, assistance or support. The paradox, of course, is that in order to have the West um, supporting our backs, uh, we need at least um, an appearance of a um, pragmatic political um, line regarding the Palestinians, and this, of course, is very, very hard for Netanyahu to do ideologically. Getting back to the Arab uh, turmoil, Netanyahu was skeptic from the beginning. I remember a, a press conference with uh, Angela Merkel a few weeks after this started, and the, w the West was very enthusiastic at that time. People were talking about that young Egyptian guy from Google who led, presumably led, demonstrations in Tahrir Square. It took a couple of months and you realize that the legacy of Tahrir Square was also one of uh, sexual harassment, massive sexual harassment, that Mubarak ended up in a cage and that Gaddafi was lynched on the street. The regional changes in the eyes of Israel, two arenas, Syria and Egypt, are changing. We're facing a threat up north regarding chemical weapons, possible Al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorism um, from the Golan Heights, a possible explosion with Hezbollah. Um, regarding the south, um, things are more or less stable. Um, perhaps the cooperation with the Egyptians is a bit better uh, than one might have uh, felt. But in both cases, both in Syria and in Egypt, uh, we're actually dealing with non-states, and the main actors there are no longer Damascus or Egypt, but Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups in both the Golan Heights and uh, Sinai. Gaza and Lebanon, again, you cannot see stability. You can talk of a, a, a relative amount of deterrence that was reached after the war in Lebanon and after the, the two recent operations, Cast Lead in 2008 and Pillar of Defense in 2012 in Gaza. Uh, but I think that the results were mixed at best. Uh, we're facing a larger variety of arenas. There's one positive uh, issue, and here I beg to differ, uh, Dr. Satloff, and that regards uh, the threat of a conventional war with one of our neighbors in the near future. Uh, the Syrian uh, army isn't up to this anymore, and those of you who know Israel um, know how much the trauma of the Yom Kippur War of 73, how important that was, how much it defined uh, the spirit of the Israeli army and the fears of the Israeli generals and politicians. This is no longer um, a relative scenario in the next few years. Things might get worse later on, but right now there is no Syrian army uh, to speak of. On the other hand, there's a mixture of uh, arenas and different kinds of wars you should prepare for. The army calls them uh, hybrid uh, warfare. Uh, we could mention Iran, we could mention a possible conflict, military conflict with Hezbollah. Uh, we could talk of uh, um, a possible uh, third intifada, a popular revolt in the uh, West Bank, cyber warfare, or even um, well-planned provocations like the Turkish flotilla of two years ago. A few words about the Israeli uh, regional uh, diplomacy. We used to talk of possible um, moderate partners of uh, Turkey, of Egypt, even Turkey, uh, even uh, Saudi Arabia to a point. Well, 
it is not going to happen. Uh, one should, uh, you know, we should curb our uh, um, expectations here and not become too optimistic about the, the chances of uh, moving forward with any of these. It's true that Israeli generals are visiting Cairo on a low profile but on a weekly basis for quite some time. Uh, I think there is a slight improvement in the relationship with Turkey, but if you followed uh, Prime Minister Zadwan uh, remarks just last week against Zionism, you know that the, you know, the, um, the basic approach, the basic approach in Ankara uh, towards Israel would, uh, would not come back to the, the, the honeymoon we enjoyed in the 90s and in the um, early years of the previous uh, decade. Um, and there's another important point, which is what to do about the Palestinians. It is not top priority, not for Netanyahu, not for President Obama. Uh, it will be discussed in uh, the president's visits in Jerusalem in a few weeks, uh, but it will be number three after Iran and after uh, Syria. Of course, Secretary Kerry is already in the region or coming to the region, but I think that he will find, like his predecessors, that uh, the whole uh, so-called Israeli-Palestinian peace process is a, is a quagmire. It's very, very hard to move forward there. Um, and uh, having mentioned that, I, I think that there is a possibility of a third intifada, not just yet. Uh, the PA is still strong enough uh, to prevent that in the, in the next few months. But giving it a year or two, I find it hard to believe that nothing would happen on the ground in the West Bank. And I, I'm afraid that both Obama and Netanyahu might find themselves uh, carried into uh, this crisis. I'd, I'd finish with a, a few remarks about um, the meaning of all this for the IDF. Um, I've just uh, talked to the chief of staff, to uh, Benny Gantz, last week. He's talking of um, huge uh, organizational changes uh, in the army. He, for the first time, he mentioned the world uh, revolution in the army. Uh, this has, um, there are a few reasons for that. One is that we're facing a small fiscal cliff of our own uh, for the first time in a couple of years. You know that the Israeli economy has been doing rather well uh, for a few years' time. But right now, the government will have to cut about 20 billion shekels, which is somewhere between five and six billion dollars, which is quite a lot by Israeli standards, immediately after the uh, new coalition is formed. One, reason, one uh, result of that would be cutbacks in the defense budget, but there's also another problem. As I mentioned, there's a, a mix of challenges here, and the army has to prepare for different kinds of warfare. In many ways, the army is still built for the old uh, wars. I've mentioned the Yom Kippur trauma. Uh, now we're talking of a different challenge altogether. Uh, the army now calls it a campaign between conflicts. It, just look at what has happened in the last few um, months according to the international media. There were Israeli airstrikes in Sudan, in Syria. There was also the pillar of defense operation. Not a wide-scale uh, war, but still uh, rather serious uh, challenges. I'm not sure, having said all that, that the old um, way that the army has been built is still uh, fitting. When you talk of all those uh, old tank divisions, that you know that the Israeli army is still using, for instance, uh, Patton tanks, which were made in, the, in uh, the U.S. in the 60s. It's true that we have Merkava 4, which is you know, the, probably the best tank in the world, but we're still using some 50-year-old tanks. Some of these divisions would probably have to go, and the army would have to establish new forces which are better prepared to deal with uh, guerrilla and terrorism. It would have to focus on, on the Air Force, on intelligence, military intelligence, it's always good to focus on intelligence, but also military intelligence. And we'll have to spend more money in this direction in the next few years. And one final point is that speaking of uh, improving the army, there will be also a necessary change in the whole system of military service. You've all followed the discussion inside Israel regarding uh, the draft for uh, Haredim, for ultra-Orthodox men for the first time. It has become a serious issue. There will be some changes made, but also the army would have to think seriously about the old system of a mandatory service for three years for everybody, for every, um, every man in the army, because probably not everybody is necessary for that. You'll have to do, differentiate between uh, different uh, systems. Thank you. Thank you, Amos and Brett and Rob. Um, the, our panelists have agreed to take questions from you all. 
So if you have a question, could you line up at either of these two microphones here? And we'll just take them in order. Although it's very early in the new Obama administration and certainly very premature in uh, Mr. Kerry's career as Secretary of State, I'm curious to know what your reaction was to uh, Secretary of State Kerry's response to the remarks that were made by the Turkish president. You're referring to Erdogan's um, remarks of uh, Zionism being a crime against humanity along with Nazism uh, and Islamophobia. Um, Erdogan, of course, is the most moderate leader in the Middle East today. <laughs> He's a paragon. He's the very man we, we uh, Washington hopes the rest of the Middle East will follow. He only has more journalists in jail than uh, any other single uh, political leader in the world, including uh, Putin and uh, the Chinese government, um, uh, and, and Kerry uh, condemned these remarks. Um, so it's, uh, look, the issue is not uh, Kerry's uh, condemning the remarks. The issue is the administration's attitude toward uh, Turkey as a pillar of American policy and influence in the Middle East, which I think is fundamentally and has always been fundamentally misplaced. The president made Ankara one of his first visits uh, in his administration back in uh, 2009. Reportedly, he's on the phone to uh, Erdogan more than any other leader. Um, but this is a guy who's been making, this is not the first vitriolically anti-Semitic uh, comment uh, that uh, Erdogan uh, has made. And the real question is whether uh, Secretary Kerry and President Obama are willing to rethink, uh, I think, their previously mistaken assumption that in Turkey we are dealing with a relatively moderate, relatively uh, friendly regime. Uh, we are not. We are dealing with a regime that has um, interests that in many ways are they're certainly inimical to Israel. Uh, they're increasingly uh, in inimical to ours. And by the way, profoundly hypocritical. Um, if you ever speak to a Greek Cypriot, Ask him about the occupation, and uh, you'll um, learn a great deal about Turkish occupation of northern Cyprus and flagrant violation of UN resolutions. Uh, but um, so that's my, my sense of Erdogan's remarks. This question is also for Mr. Stevens. I was wondering if you could please comment on Chuck Hagel, his confirmation as. <laughs> His confirmation as Secretary of Defense and what you think that says about Obama's commitment to the American-Israel relationship and what it says about his commitment to preventing Iran from going nuclear. Well, as you know, I was one of Chuck Hagel's biggest fans and supporters. <laughs> uh, couldn't have been more enthusiastic about his nomination and, of course, the confirmation hearing just uh, just proved to me that uh, no finer mind has been uh, <laughs> uh, put in that uh, uh, put in that position um, look I I'm just gonna, I'm gonna speak very frankly I think it was an out absolutely outrageous pick of a firebrand senator <laughs> who is, and with all respect to his heroism in Vietnam, uh, or his being getting wounded in Vietnam, his service in Vietnam, um, uh, that is not alone qualification to be Secretary of Defense. There are thousands and thousands of Americans who have sacrificed and volunteered and been in the military and taken, and taken shots for the United States. Not all of them are qualified to be Secretary of, of Defense. Certainly not someone whose who's, uh, stated views over many years are not just inimical to, I think, the sensibilities of most people in this room, but to the stated policy of the administration itself. And this is a man whose idea uh, is that Iran is this kind of misunderstood nation um, for which, uh, which requires the kind of emollient of engagement in order to bring us to a, a rapprochement. Now that idea may have had some plausibility, it was always wrong, but it may have had some plausibility four or five years ago, but the administration spent four years trying to extend its hand uh, to the Iranians to be rebuffed at every single occasion. And yet Hegel basically held firm to that view. I found his comments about, um, I mean, everyone jumped on, not everyone, but a few, 
columnists here and there jumped on me uh, for talking about his comments about the Jewish lobby and how offensive they were. Well, the term the Jewish lobby, I, you know, is, is not really the issue. The issue is the verb he used. The Jewish lobby intimidates a lot of people up here. Everyone said, oh, well, okay, you should have said Israel lobby, but not, not, not the Jewish lobby. It had nothing to do with that. It's the phrase intimidates. This is a senator from Nebraska. There are probably one or two Nebraskans in this room, okay? I suspect you did not wield main force in terms of Nebraska politics, and you versus the ethanol lobby, I'm just guessing here, uh, it was probably an uncertain fight, but I'd like to hear Chuck Hagel talk about how much the ethanol lobby intimidated him and how he was forced to vote for you know, one stupid farm bill after another that he didn't, you know, that made no sense. There's a very, very uh, uh, eyebrow-raising turn of phrase. So this guy gets nominated, he gets defended in ways that are frightening. Um, he basically puts in the worst performance ever in terms of a confirmation hearing. Uh, you know, I was reminded there was a Nebraska senator, another one called Roman Hruska, who famously said there ought to be a place for the mediocrities on the Supreme Court. And, you know, Chuck Hagel is the vindication of that principle uh, <laughs> in, um, uh, but at the, uh, at the Defense Department. Furthermore, and finally, it's not simply a matter of uh, policy, it's a matter of competence. This is a big department. This is the biggest department of the United States government. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people about to undergo major, potentially major and historic changes in terms of force composition, force structure, the availability of ships, aircraft, and, and so on. Um, you probably want the smartest guy in, your, in the room to be secretary at a moment like this, I would challenge anyone, including people who you know, weren't inclined to dislike him as much as I, I was at the beginning, to say after watching those confirmation hearings, yeah, here is a guy I feel confident in when it comes to, uh, when it comes to running the Pentagon at a moment like this. One final point, um, you know. What do you really think, Brett? <laughs> Um, listen, I lost, so you got to give me some. Uh, you got to give me a moment here. Just one final point. If I were an Israeli decision maker, and I had been there in, in the rooms in August and September when the Americans were saying, "Don't go after Iran because we're going to get serious about it after the election," and then the president goes and nominates a guy like Chuck Hagel to be Secretary of Defense, I would be drawing some conclusions. So it's hard to imagine a worse signal that the administration could have sent the Israeli government in terms of its, that is, America's seriousness about Iran, than in nominating Chuck Hagel to be Secretary of Defense. Maybe Amos has some views on that. <laughs> Otherwise, he's a great pick. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carrie Greenwald. I'm from Atlanta. First, thank you very much to the panelists. This question is regarding Syria, and it's for all of you. I know about a year ago, Hillary Clinton put together a plan to have the U.S. arm Syrian rebels, and President Obama turned it down. And I'm wondering if you think that was a mistake, and if you think we're going to reverse course, and if it's going to make any difference at this point. I'll try and approach it from the Israeli point of view. Um, is, I'll say something which isn't exactly politically correct. But well, very close. Just bring it. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, there is an aspect from the Israeli point of view which is not ex entirely politically correct, but there, there is, um, and you will not hear it from Israeli officials, but there is some advantage in the fact that the war there is going on. Of course, it's dangerous for Israel in, in certain aspects, but the fact that the uh, Syrian army is so busy uh, killing its own, uh, its own civilians for such a long time means that the danger, the immediate conventional uh, <coughs> danger towards Israel uh, has changed. Israel would not be involved in any way in arming or supporting uh, the rebels because this would be a kiss of death uh, in the eyes of the, of the Arab world and the support uh, the rebels are getting. About the United States, I cannot give advice uh, to the Americans over this. I did read that there was a change in policy last week about supplying some more, but I, I think that the, the approach, the general approach of the administration regarding this, which has been very careful in Egypt, in Libya, one step forward, two steps back, 
and so on uh, remains. And it's not, again, it's not the responsibility of Israel. It might be the responsibility of the Western world, but not Israel. I think the United States has uh, adopted perhaps the worst possible policy in Syria. A policy that is, um, uh, that if you were looking at this from Mars, you would say is designed to help bring about um, a jihadist regime in Syria, um, the worst possible outcome for American interests in the region. Um, of course, it's not, th that is not the intent of our policy. Uh, the intent of our policy is to recognize um, uh, that, um, oh, there are no real good guys and bad guys anymore, that, are, that now it's too late to change the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the balance of power. Um, uh, earlier it was too early to change the balance of power, now it's too late to change the balance of power by providing weapons. Um, uh, frankly, I think it's, it's absolutely shameful what has gone on. Uh, 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 not, and, and put aside, put aside the horrendous humanitarian cost, uh, um, which I don't think we should put aside, but put it aside for a minute. The strategic imperative for acting in Syria in my view, is absolutely clear vis-a-vis -vis Iran, vis-a-vis -vis the jihadists, vis-a-vis -vis, um, the repercussions for our allies, absolutely clear. This does not mean boots on the ground. It never meant American soldiers, the 82nd in Damascus, like it was in, uh, in Baghdad, and people who caricatured what the United States could have done to help change the tide of this conflict a year and a half ago. There's a place in hell for these people. I'm sorry. Because America, I think, could have made a big difference early on, would have, would have saved not just thousands of lives, but this would have been before the jihadization of this conflict. And now, now we're going to face like, the potential series of worst case outcomes. Now, it might not be. Maybe we will be saved from the worst case outcomes. Maybe the Syrian people will somehow find a way to make peace with themselves and have a well-ordered, reasonably um, uh, a bloodless transition to some functioning government. How many people in this room think that's what's going to happen? I don't. And I think the repercussions will be felt by our partners in Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon and Iraq and, of course, in Israel. I feel it was, um, uh, I, have an un I know why the administration had this approach until November 4th. I assumed that on November 5th there would have been a change of uh, U.S. policy. I was wrong. And now um, when I read the president's uh, uh, New Republic interview um, a month ago, a few weeks ago, when he said it would be, we, we don't want to act hastily <laughs> two years into this conflict. We don't want to act in haste. That sort of said enough about where I think uh, we're going with U.S. policy in Syria. Oh, well, um, look, uh, I have very little to I have very little to add to what Rob just said, which I, I agree with entirely. Let me um, challenge what Amos described. I know he wasn't describing his own view, uh, Israeli conventional wisdom, which is that this, this uh, civil war isn't quite the wor word. I think this sort of Habesian situation, uh, war of all against all in, in Syria, somehow benefits, um, benefits Israel. I think that's, that's a mistake. It does not benefit Israel that because there are now hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees in Jordan, Jordan is now under, that, the monarchy is under greater pressure than it ever had been before. It doesn't benefit Israel that Hezbollah may now have a motive as an ally of both Damascus and Iran to become a troublemaker as they clearly might have been attempting to do by bringing in this shipment of, of what I gather were anti-aircraft missiles. It doesn't benefit Israel to have a situation in which there are chemical weapons that are moving hither and yon, uh, so to speak, um, uh, hopefully 
under a watchful eye of satellites and so on, but you can never be quite, quite certain when you're talking about stockpiles of, uh, of this material. It doesn't benefit Israel that you're basically supercharging a new generation of jihadis the way the Afghan war in, in the 1980s supercharged a previous generation of jihadis in Syria. It won't benefit Israel if what succeeds the Assad regime, if the Assad regime has, uh, has a successor, is a more extreme uh, Salafist or jihadist uh, um, group of uh, uh, leaders than even, say, uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, people said uh, Kissinger's famous line about the Iran-Iraq war, may it last forever. Um, that's a somewhat pernicious fantasy, not only because of the killing and the scale of the devastation involved, but Iraq came out of the Iran-Iraq war and promptly invaded Kuwait, and Iran came out of it and promptly started developing its WMD, its nuclear, uh, its nuclear program. So we shouldn't assume that it's in any way a benefit to Israel's security that Syria is collapsing on its doorstep.